Hey guys, Julie here. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 13. Today we're looking at the geometry shader. This is the last shader that we're going to be adding to our pipeline before we get into dynamic lighting. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird one. It's, got, it's quite of a powerful shader and it'll be a lot of fun to look at. It won't be too hard. So uh, let's dig right in here. What is a geometry shader? Well, up until now in our pipeline, we've got our triangle assembler and that indexes into the vertex stream to create triangles. Those triangles are passed to the uh, the post processor, the pube space transformer, if you will. And that one just takes each of these triangles in and transforms them and passes them on to the triangle rasterization part of our pipeline. So what we're going to do is in between uh, the triangle assembly and the post processing, we're going to put in here a geometry shader. So this one is going to take in a bunch of triangles, right? Uh, assembled from this stream and these indices. It's going to take in a bunch of these triangles and for each one of those it's going to do some processing on them, processing on the vertices of the triangle and it is going to output a triangle. So for each triangle in, you get a triangle out. Now, you might be saying, Chili, what is the point of this? If you're just processing the vertices, why not just do that in the vertex uh, shader? Why do you need a separate shader for this? Well, the vertex shader has a bit of tunnel vision, right? It just looks at each vertex individually. It can't see what kind of triangle that vertex is a part of. But the geometry shader, it gets all three triangle, all three vertices of the triangle at once. It can see what kind of triangle it's looking at and it can use that information to do some more advanced processing. That's one difference. Another difference is in the vertex shader you've got uh, a vertex right but it's like part of it's like part of a mesh right so if you change this vertex you're going to be changing you know in this case four triangles but with the geometry shader this is after the uh, triangles have been assembled so each triangle you get is an individual triangle like if you had a mesh like this and you modified the uh, the vertex of this triangle this one is now no longer affected because they're separate they have been separated in the triangle assembly stage so they're independent. So it's got more information, it can see a bigger part of the picture, and it doesn't affect everything in the mesh when you change one vertex. Now there's one more difference here, and that is after triangle assembly, every one of these triangles, you can give it a uh, an ID for each triangle you generate, uh, and you can use that to do some cool shit, and we're going to be using that in this video. So again, as with the uh, vertex shader, the first thing we're going to do is just incorporate it into the pipeline and make sure all of our existing effects are working with it. So we go into pipeline.h and uh, let's see what changes here. Well, we, we need a new type def now for geometry shader output, gs out, because a geometry shader can output different kinds of vertices than the vertices that were input. It can add or remove information just like the uh, vertex shader could do. So we got that, and uh, let me see here. Well, that's 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 for another story. So where where is the shit going down here? Well, uh, in process triangle, before process triangle was just basically passing the uh, vertices it got in. It was passing those on to the post process. Now it's actually going to do some real work. So it's going to get in three vertices. From the uh, from the vertex shader, and it is going to first call the effect.gs. It's going to call the geometry shader on those, and then the triangle that it gets out from that, it is going to pass that on to post process triangle vertices. So we're now invoking the geometry shader, and we're passing it the three vertices, and we're also passing it. I hate this. We're also passing it a triangle index. So every uh, every triangle that is assembled here in assembled triangles, it is going to be assigned a, a unique index. Actually, this is weird because I'm not I'm not uh, incrementing the index anywhere. I think I changed this in the next. It was probably a bug because I didn't actually use the triangle index yet. I didn't have a chance to test it. So you'll see later on it'll be uh, incremented. But in any effect, the uh, geometry shader is going to be getting a unique index for each triangle that it processes, and it can use that information if it so pleases. And, but that's the main change there. Now all of these guys that were uh, working with VS out are now working with GS out because that might be different depending on what the geometry shader does. 
Um, but beyond that, that's no real biggie. And then again, we create a default geometry shader, which does nothing, just passes those guys through, and we, uh, we update all our effects to define that default geometry shader so that it is available. Um, and then all of our shit works. Now, let's look at actually using the geometry shader to do something. All right, so first things first, there's the, that bug that I mentioned before, we had to fix that. So in assemble triangles in the loop here, we are now incrementing the, uh, the triangle index. So begin, I didn't mention it before, but uh, begin frame now resets the triangle index to zero. So every time you begin a frame or a new uh, frame of your, your shit, you are going to reset the triangle index to zero, and then every triangle is going to get a fresh index. It's going to be incremented every time we assemble a triangle. Uh, even cold triangles will get an index, so they won't, the triangles that the geometry shader sees, it might see gaps because some of them have been cold, uh, but every triangle is at least guaranteed to get a unique index. Now the effect I added here to test out the geometry shader, it is going to use those indices to do something that we couldn't do before. So remember when we drew, let me, let me just show you here. So you remember when we were drawing our, uh, our cube with the different solid colors on it. And the way we did this was we duplicated geometry, right? So we had to duplicate, like for example, this vertex is actually duplicated three times to keep all of the vertices independent. You can't share vertices between these different triangles because then you would get blending. Uh, you would have problems, right? You can't have a vertex that has different colors for different triangles. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but what we can do with the geometry shader so in the geometry shader here, in the data, we've got a vector of colors, and those colors correspond to the triangles in the geometry that we're going to render. So we can use the triangle indices to index into this and to figure out the colors for the, yeah, for the triangles. So what we can do now is now, instead of inputting uh, geometry with duplicated vertices where every vertex has to hold the color of the triangle that it is going to be uh, used for. Instead of doing that, we can just input vertices with no color, only position, and instead, when we get the, uh, when we get the triangle IDs, we can use that to index into this and to decide the colors of the vertices. So now the output of the geometry shader is gonna have color, input had no color, and in the uh, geometry shader function here, all we're doing is uh, we're creating a uh, vertex based on the position plus the color that is done by looking up in the uh, in the triangle index in here. Now I'm doing triangle index divided by two because, you know, it's a cube, every face has two triangles, so I only have to store half as many colors. So uh, this, this shader is really very closely geared towards rendering a cube, uh, or at least rendering something that's built out of quads. But anyways, that's, that's besides the point. The point is here now our geometry has, can hold much less data. We're holding much, much less data because first of all, we don't need to store the color, and second of all, we don't need to uh, triplicate all of the vertices. And in the pixel shader, we just return the color that is stored in uh, in the interpolant. And the geometry shader output vertex type, it doesn't have to interpolate between the colors. Uh, that's no problem. It just stores the colors in the vertices and that's it just works. Because for any given triangle, all the vertices are gonna have the same color. It's guaranteed by this geometry shader. And then in cube solid geometry scene, we are creating our index triangle list with cube get plane. Notice that this is not creating uh, with independent faces. These faces are all dependent on each other. And we bind colors to the uh, geometry shader here. This is just a uh, vector of colors, uh, one for each face of the cube. And that is about it. The rest of it just works like you would normally have and uh, works exactly like we had with the independent faces, only this one is using much less, um, much less data for the index triangle list. So uh, yeah, just a little sexy usage of the geometry shader there with uh, primitive IDs, triangle ID.
Man, the last thing I did here is just a couple of a uh, couple of little tweaks here. So solid geometry effect. Let's see, take a look at the pipeline. So in the pipeline, I decided instead of storing triangle index for the entire frame, indexes should really be reset for each um, each individually draw call because that's how it works in you know Direct 3D and OpenGL. So instead of having a separate triangle list, we just use I here and then we pass in I. And thus we don't need to store this triangle index anymore in our pipeline. So that's the basics of one practical use of our geometry shader here. It can allow us to um, basically, so we don't have to duplicate our geometry when we want our triangles to be independent of each other in a mesh. Another way you could use a geometry shader is um, because it has, it sees all of the vertices of a triangle, you can use it to dynamically generate the face normal of every triangle and then you don't have to pass that in with the, uh, with the geometry. And we're going to use that in the next video. But right now, I want to talk about the differences between the geometry shader that we've implemented here and the actual geometry shader of the uh, the 3D graphics hardware as it is exposed via Direct 3D or OpenGL. So the first difference is that the geometry shader is actually optional. You don't have to provide one. You must provide a vertex shader and you must provide a pixel shader, but you do not need to provide a geometry shader. The second difference kind of ties into the first one, and that is uh, in our system here, the triangle assembler, it is generating the IDs and it is passing them to the uh, geometry shader. Uh, but because the geometry shader is optional in Direct3D, um, what happens is the, the triangle assembler, in Direct3D it's called the input assembler because the pipeline works not only with triangles but with other primitives. Anyways, uh, it can pass this ID directly on to the pixel shader if the geometry shader is not present. So those are a couple of small changes. Here is a big difference. Uh, and the big difference is the geometry shader in 3D hardware, it can output a different kind of primitive than it gets in. So for example, uh, I mean in our system here, we're only dealing with triangle primitive, primitives, right? But in uh, Direct 3D, you've got a whole bunch of different primitives. You've got point, you've got line, you've got triangle strip, you've got a bunch of different primitives that you can input. And those will be, the vertices of those primitives will be processed. The geometry shader will receive those primitives, but it can output a different kind of primitive. So for example, let's say you want to render a bunch of sprites. Normally, if you want to render a bunch of sprites, you're going to have to uh, input a primitive that has four vertices, right? And it's indexed, so it's going to have six indices and four vertices, and each of those vertices are gonna have texture, coordinates, and uh, maybe some other information, and that's all, and you're gonna have a bunch of these guys input into your pipeline. Uh, but what you can do with the geometry shader is your input, you can just have individual points, and maybe they, these points have information about what sprite, so they'll have a sprite ID, right? And what'll happen is those points will get transformed with the vertex shader. And then when they hit the ge geometry shader, the geometry shader can take those points and can take the, uh, the sprite ID and it can generate, it can generate dynamically the, uh, the textured quad. So it can use a lookup table to look at what sprite needs what texture coordinates and it will generate a, uh, a textured quad out of just single points and that can really lower the amount of bandwidth that you need between the CPU and the GPU because you're only sending in points with a single ID and you know a position and those are getting expanded into an entire uh, textured quad. So in real 3D hardware, you can the geometry shader can output a completely different kind of primitive than it takes in. Now the other thing that is different that a geometry shader has in 3D hardware is it can output a different number of primitives than it takes in. So for example, it can take in one triangle and it could output zero triangles or it could output 50 triangles um, with one input. So it can, uh, and if you output more than you're getting in, that's amplification. It can amplify the geometry, but it can also uh, reject. So it can take in one triangle and decide, no, I'm not gonna draw that shit. And honestly, we could do this one easily in the current pipeline, uh, but we're not going to do that because it's this, uh, this feature, the ability to amplify your geometry, it's actually not used that much in uh, practice. I mean, the ability to output a different 
kind of primitive is something that we couldn't do easily with our system because our system only works with triangles, right? Uh, so that one is kind of out of the question for, for this course. But we could have done the, uh, the geometry amplification. That wouldn't be too hard. We're just not doing it because it's actually not used, and I'll explain that in a second. Now, I told you that the geometry shader is more powerful than the vertex shader because it doesn't have tunnel vision, right? It sees all the vertices of the triangle. Well, it can actually have more power than that in shader model 4. Not only does it see the vertices in the triangle it's working on, it also sees the extra vertices of the adjacent triangles. So it has a lot of information to work with if used in certain modes. So in certain operational modes, it has a ton of information to work with. Now, you might be saying at this point, Chili, this geometry shader, this sounds like the shit. You can do anything with this. And uh, yeah, you can do a lot of cool shit with it. And But maybe those of you who have done a little research into hardware 3D might already know geometry shader isn't used that much. And the reason why it isn't used that much is because it happens to not be very fast. Now, remember I told you that uh, geometry shader can output multiple uh, primitives, it can amplify geometry. Well, it turns out that if you amplify geometry in your geometry shader, the performance is just fucking, the shit hits the fan, it is terrible. So you ne people never use it. Like, you could use a geometry shader for tessellation, for breaking up a simple piece of geometry up into smaller, more, um, more detailed parts, but nobody uses it for that because it's goddamn slow. And even if you don't do amplification, geometry shader still tends to not be the fastest so for example that um that example i showed you of inputting points and outputting a textured quad um that doesn't actually amplify geometry you're getting one primitive in and one primitive out but um it's still i don't think that it's the main technique used to do that you could do it that way but i wouldn't be too bad but i believe there is some other stuff that is even better for that so while the geometry shader is actually like just has superpowers and is amazing is also not used that often. There are there are uses though. I'm not just teaching you this for no good reason. So it has some niche uses. Uh, one use is it is used for a kind of layered rendering, which is it's an advanced topic, but it's used in things like shadow mapping. So uh, when you get into the advanced stage, you will still need to use the geometry shader for some techniques. But mostly, I just put it in here because it's the next shader that was introduced after uh, Pixel Shader and Vertex Shader. It was introduced in DirectX 10. It fit in nicely into what I was doing. We'll be able to uh, put it to good use in the future tutorials. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just an interesting one I wanted to cover. Now, I said that the Geometry Shader it's not good for doing tessellation. It was probably originally intended for tessellation, but turned out not so great. So you might be saying, well, how do engines do tessellation now? Well, in DirectX 11, they introduced the uh, tessellation shaders and the whole shader and the domain shader. So those ones are much better for tessellation. And uh, we won't be covering them in this series, but I'll get on to them in hardware 3D. But there we have it. We have all of the, uh, all the shader stages that I want to introduce in 3D Fundamentals, they're now all in our pipeline. Everything is flowing and the stage is set for us now to create some more interesting shader programs because now our pipeline has been set up. So look forward to the next tutorial when we start to get into dynamic lighting. This is the real fun shit. This is what I've been waiting for. But I also encourage you guys now, because we have the pipeline set up, to experiment with yourself, try to create some interesting effects. Uh, and if you come up with something cool, let me know. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D fundamentals.